Welcome, everybody. We've given our few minutes of honorary waiting time, but I think it's time to begin now. You're all very welcome, and thank you for coming out on this not very pleasant evening. Uh, my name is Father Jerry Whelan. Uh, I'm in uh, charge of a licentiate that we're uh, trying to advertise to you all, uh, but uh, you might hear a bit more about that later. It's called uh, Specialization in Comparative Theology and Christian Traditions uh, of Christian Traditions and Ecumenical Studies. Uh, the, so um, tonight we're delighted to have our two speakers of great stature uh, that know whereof they speak, shall we say. Um, the theme, as you've seen uh, in, in our advertising, is um, Ecumenism, International Relations and Peace Building, the Search for Christian Unity in an Unstable World. Uh, the, uh, before introducing our speakers anymore, I would like to welcome uh, warmly our rector, uh, Father Mark Lewis. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Your Excellencies, Your Graces, Your Lordships, participants, <laughs> faculty, students, and guests, welcome everyone, friends. Since the decree on ecumenism from the Vatican Council in 1964 until today, we've been exploring together ways in which the Christian faith might be reintegrated in common faith, purpose, and action. Today's Lectio Magistralis by the Reverend Dr. James Hockey, canon theologian of Westminster Abbey, provides us with a point of departure in reflecting on ecumenism. In today's world, finding peace remains the central theme. As we know, religion can be used to divide and incite violence or to build bridges towards peace. For this reason, the search for peace requires the ability to live and work together. Canon Hockey, whom we welcome tonight, although you're already at home here, I know, brings considerable knowledge and experience to this task, despite his youth. I was telling him Lexio Magistralis is usually for more experienced theologians. He read theology at Cambridge and completed his doctorate in ecclesiology under the direction of Daniel Hardy and Eamon Duffy. Part of his preparation for ministry included a semester as an exchange student at the venerable English College while studying at the Angelicum. His ability to move from there to here simply underlines his expertise in ecumenism. So welcome to the other, to the dark side, I suppose I should say. Responding to Canon Hockey will be His Excellency Archbishop Paul Gallagher, Secretary of the Section for Relationships with States and International Organizations of the Secretariat of State. Archbishop Gallagher, a native of Liverpool, obtained his doctorate in canon law here at the Gregorian University while preparing for diplomatic service at the Academia here in Rome. He was nuncio in Burundi in Australia before returning to Rome to serve in the Secretariat of State. His experience in diplomatic, in diplomatic processes brings a much different vision to tonight's conference. Archbishop Gallagher, you're, you too are always welcome back to your alma mater. We look forward to your comments. Tonight's event, the first one organized by the Licentiate in Comparative Theology of Christian Traditions and Ecumenical Studies, intends to provide a solid background for the study of the theological traditions of different Christian denominations and to promote within the faculty the development of a place and a network aimed at ecumenical dialogue. In this, it reflects the outline of Unitatis Redintrigatio that calls for, quote, dialogue between competent experts from different churches and communities. At these meetings, which are organized in a religious spirit, each explains the teaching of, this com of his communion in greater depth and brings out clearly its distinctive features. In such a dialogue, everyone gains a truer knowledge and more just appreciation of the teaching and religious life of both communions. The result of that process, the council hoped, would lead all participants to examine their own faithfulness to Christ's will for the church, and accordingly to undertake with vigor the task of renewal and reform. This task is simply made more important because of the particular challenges of our own time. And so I will close and let the, the conversation go on with a prayer that it will help to make us all better in seeking and living the peace that this world needs but cannot easily find. Thank you and have a good conference.
Thank you very much to Father Lewis, our rector. Um, he's done a lot of my work for me, actually. The, uh, but if I can say another few words about um, Professor Jamie Hawkey uh, here. Uh, the, at a more personal level, the uh, born and educated in Sussex, uh, read theology at Cambridge before uh, doing his MPH, MPhil and PhD degrees as a Gosden Scholar of Selwyn College, Cambridge. The, uh, he was ordained a priest in 2008, although he and I met 17 years ago, I think, uh, in my first arrival here in Rome when he was a, 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 a fellow, shall we say, or a, a present in the Venerable English College for um, a semester, I think. The, um, so uh, he is the uh, Canon Theologian of Westminster Ab Abbey, Chair of the Westminster Abbey Institute. He's Chaplain to His Majesty the King, and is a by fellow of Clare College, Cambridge, where he also served as Dean. He is a visiting professor of theology at King's College, London, and is also our ecumenical working and involved with, with this uh, 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 licentiate program that I've just described. Dr. Hawkey has been very engaged at a formal level as well as, of course, informal levels in ecumenism. Uh, he's been a member of the Reformed Anglican Dialogue and is a member of the steering committee of the Anglican Roman Catholic Malin Conversation Group since its inception in 2013. The, his other publications include that he's co-author of the commentary of the latest stated agreement of the Anglican Catholic International Commission, ARCIC, published in 2018. The, um, if I may just uh, conti continue with uh, having looked at his publication list, and of course I won't read his lengthy list of articles and books, but uh, the, I, I mentioned that he knows whereof he speaks uh, tonight. That, so certainly the credentials of active engagement with ecumenism, but his publication list also indicates uh, that this theme of peacemaking, the church engaging with culture. So I'll just uh, mention some brief um, titles. His doctoral thesis, The Temporal Shaping of the Church's Identity, A Study of the Apostolicity of the Church, The Sanctification of Culture, and the Eschatological Horizon. The uh, other titles, just almost randomly uh, chosen here. The Theology of Hope, Looking Forward and Back, Fair enough, question mark, a vision for justice in the 21st century. On the 15th anniversary of Vatican II, excavating apostolicity, Christian communities and secular cultures. So we're eager to hear and we welcome you most warmly, Professor Jamie Hawkey. Grazie mille. Uh, Eccellenza Monsignor Gallagher, Eccellenza Padre Decano, e illustri professori, fratelli e sorelle, è un enorme privilegio essere invitato a tenere questa lezio magistralis <laughs> sul tema ecumenismo, relazioni internazionali e costruzione della pace, la ricerca dell'unità dei cristiani in un mondo instabile. Sono molto grato per l'invito e all'Archivescovo Gallagher per aver accettato di rispondere. Lo scorso anno accademico ho avuto la gioia di essere stato professore invitato qui alla Gregoriana e di insegnare nella nuova licenza per gli studi ecumenici accanto al professore Peckles. Questa è una comunità accademica speciale è a me molto cara e stasera è per me un'occasione per dire grazie a tutti coloro che si sono impegnati a ricevere il dono dell'unità in Cristo. Esprimo anche i miei ringraziamenti a traduttori e ora mi scuso per il fatto che il resto di questa confidenza si svolgerà, mi dispiace, in inglese. È meglio per tutti, certo. So, ecumenism, international relations and peace building, the search for Christian unity in an unstable world. Since the invasion of Ukraine in February 2022, 
the world has begun to notice that geopolitics and ecumenism are bound up together. For example, it is impossible to fully understand that particular conflict without a sense of the different Christian narratives at play in Russia and Ukraine. Policymakers, the military, secular journalists have woken up to the fact that religions other than Islam can still strongly influence the political. For a long time, ecumenism was viewed as a secondary category in the realm of academic theology, made more respectable only by its close association with ecclesiology. Whilst such biases still exist, they are now less frequently deployed. When we are asked why the unity of the church matters, one straightforward answer would simply be to say that it is the will and command of the Lord. But for those who require more convincing, there are practical arguments for ecumenism's non-optional role in the life of the church. It's often remarked that the integrity of the church's witness is deeply compromised by our divisions. Our practices of separation undermine the gospel itself. A further practical, convincing development of this observation was frequently quoted by Archbishop Desmond Tutu, reflecting on the context of his own South Africa. Apartheid was too strong for a divided church. First articulated by the South African Anglican Communion Partners at the Partners in Mission consultation in Modaport in 1987, Tutu quoted this liberally in the years that followed. The violence and sin of apartheid was simply too strong for a divided church to deal with. In this lecture, I'm going to argue that an essential part of our ongoing ecumenical encounter will be to insist on the conscious integration of the theological and the practical, and to see these streams of ecumenical life as mutually constituting the church's unity. A strong methodological theme of this exploration will be to try and avoid saying or implying that a common theological commitment or a common project in the realms of justice and peace is either this or that. Our method needs to become much more holistic than it often is if we are to really notice the quality of the relationship that we already live together. On the 5th of October 2016, Pope Francis and Archbishop Justin Welby commissioned 19 pairs of Anglican and Catholic bishops for joint mission in their own contexts from the Church of San Gregorio al Celio, from which Pope St. Gregory the Great sent St. Augustine, the first Archbishop of Canterbury, to England. To mark this next stage in a relationship which has been underpinned by a narrative of gifts and signs alongside and illuminating the formal theological dialogue, the Archbishop received from the Pope a copy of a crozier head which belonged to Gregory the Great, whereas the Pope received from the Archbishop a pectoral cross in the form of nails, used by the community of the Cross of Nails, which has its origins in nails found in the burnt-out ruins of Coventry Cathedral in the UK after a massive air raid in 1940. This cross of nails is now used ecumenically and in many places throughout the world to represent ongoing work of reconciliation. The next day, at Vespers, each pair of Anglican and Catholic bishops was given a symbol of their joint witness by the Archbishop and Cardinal Paralin. This symbol was a Lampedusa cross, each one made out of rough timber collected from the wrecks of small boats carrying migrants across the dangerous waters of the Mediterranean. Now this gift represented a striking integration of theology and practice, a partial drawing out of the implications of everything that Anglicans and Catholics have learned to say about one another and have said together in over 50 years of formal theological dialogue. Here, we are on the cusp of something of great importance. Having covered such a wide range of theological topics 
and formulated joint statements on a huge number of questions of first order theological importance. Our two communions have a particularly powerful expression of a common faith in which to root their ministry in the world. One of the challenges remains, of course, that of reception. In other words, how the formulations of our theological agreements take root in and express the life of the church. Are these joint statements recognizable? Can they receive the assent, the amen of the people of God? IARCUM, the joint conference of Catholic and Anglican bishops formed in Mississauga in 2000, which led to those pairings of bishops in 2016, was formed in part to assist with that process of reception. In their own joint commitment of October 2016, these pairs of bishops made a powerful statement about the nature of the unity they had discovered through a pilgrimage of walking together. I quote them. We have discovered that as Christ draws us closer to the full visible unity which is his will, we are led to the foot of the cross, where we stand together with the one who bears the pain of broken humanity. This, too, is a deep experience of communion, which some have described as a communion of poverty, even persecution, even blood. During these days together, we have shared testimonies from both communities, struggling in dire circumstances in our respective regions. These included environmental degradation, mass migration, war and persecution relating in refugees, displaced populations, and post-conflict trauma, societal decisions eroding the dignity of human life from beginning to natural end, human trafficking, and modern slavery. This ecumenism of the cross unites us as we bear together the plight of our people who face the challenges of our troubled world." End quote. These Catholic and Anglican bishops went on to identify other categories of ecumenical identity. They spoke of an ecumenism of humiliation in terms of how our churches have failed to adequately protect the vulnerable and exploited, and even of a communion of shame in allowing narratives of secularization to develop and triumph in many contexts. Now, there are legitimate questions to be asked here about appropriate use of terms. We are not used to encountering words such as ecumenism or communion in a negative sense. Although the recent report of the International Reformed Anglican Dialogue helpfully reflects on how communion can so easily be weaponized or corrupted. And yet, of course, communion, koinonia, can simply mean a sharing in something. The communion we share, according to our own texts, real but imperfect, is not an abstract thing but rather a communion in Christ. And therefore, our communion in Christ can be encountered in different modes. This is similarly and importantly the case with the ministry our churches share. The ministry we share is none other than the ministry of Christ. There is no Christian ministry apart from this. There is not a category of ministry any more than there is a category of communion to which we hold one another apart from a ministry in Christ. The document of Archic I on ministry agreed in 1973 said this, the life and self-offering of Christ perfectly express what it is to serve God and man. All Christian ministry, whose purpose is always to build up the community, koinonia, flows and takes its shape from this source and model. The question is how we analyze that sharing, how we hold one another to account, and how we commit to a mutual deepening of our relationship that we can notice what the Lord is doing in and through our churches. 
In a famous sermon on the Ascension, St. Leo the Great set out a clear principle of sacramental theology which has underpinned so much of the church's teaching for the subsequent millennium and a half. What was visible in our Savior has passed over into his mysteries, preached St. Leo. Since the resourcement currents of the mid-20th century and through the ecumenical movement, we have developed sacramental theologies which are more holistic than some of their more narrowly scholastic counterparts. What was visible in our Savior, to use St. Leo's words, is not just Christ's passion, death, and resurrection, but rather his whole ministry, his proclamation of the kingdom, and his miracles. The church, herself the prime sacrament, the Ur sacrament, according to Karl Rahner, celebrates the totality of Christ's mystery, the totus Christus, the whole Christ, through her sacramental acts. During the 20th century and into our own, we have experienced a renewed consciousness of the relationship between liturgy and life, and between what we once thought of as the more distinct disciplines of sacramental and pastoral theology. The major challenge before us, I suggest, is the further essential integration of all this. Can we find our way towards the necessary mentality shift which will integrate our theological reflection and our practice, and for Anglicans and Catholics to integrate our learnt and lived experience of ministry together with our extraordinary doctrinal agreements so that they shift us into a richer consciousness of communion. In what remains of this lecture, I want to pursue then a particular question which refers to the church's action, her ministry in that whole sense, in the context of a world which is perhaps in greater peril across the board than at any other time in history. How can we take proper theological account of joint action in the realms of justice and peace, diplomacy and conflict stabilization, of common work during the climate crisis, in a way which demonstrably builds up the gift of communion, which we already share. When Jesus inaugurates his own ministry in Galilee, recorded in St. Luke's Gospel, he quotes the prophet Isaiah, and tells those in the synagogue that today the scripture has been fulfilled. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me and chrisen me to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This is the manifesto for the ministry of the anointed one. The verb anoint, creo, is cognate with Christos. St. Luke making explicitly clear that he is speaking about Jesus' vocation as Messiah, in Hebrew, anointed one. It is this ministry that the church shares. If you like, it is this visible ministry which has passed over into the sacramental life of the church. The night before he dies, Jesus sets out a clear agenda of faith, proclamation, and practice for his followers. He washes their feet, that tactile sign of service. And it is this sign of loving service which will ensure the believer's participation in Jesus' ministry. Unless I wash you, you have no share with me, Jesus tells Peter. He then immediately instructs his disciples to follow his example. Now, of course, in St. John's Gospel, you will remember there is no explicit account of the Last Supper. But it is from precisely this vantage point that we plunge into the farewell discourse and St. John's account of Jesus' passion and resurrection. The washing of the feet and the whole Paschal mystery are one movement, one story, and the unveiling of one integrated ministry. That is the ministry of Christ the Eternal Word and the Eternal High Priest who gives his life at the heart of the world so that we may live. 
we've become so used to thinking about the relationship between what we might think of as the church's social ministry and the church's liturgy. There are so many examples of work in both our communions which explore that theme. But we are not so accustomed to thinking about how the church's social ministry, rooted in the ministry of Christ the eternal high priest, nourishes communion. Our theological concepts and our theological language are still relatively weak when we analyze this. In such a context, it was particularly encouraging to read Pope Francis's motto proprio ad theologiam promovendam of All Saints Day this year, in which the Holy Father said this, theological reflection is called to a turning point, to a paradigm shift, to a courageous cultural revolution that commits it first and foremost to be a fundamentally contextual theology, capable of reading and interpreting the gospel in the conditions in which men and women daily live, in different geographical, social, and cultural environments, and having as its archetype the incarnation of the eternal logos, its entering into the culture, worldview, and religious tradition of a people." End quote. The Pope offers us here a theological vision of the church's cultural engagement, but also a vision of culture itself. These are both categories for rich theological exploration as our world becomes more complex, not less. In the face of increasing connectivity and the challenges of cultural analysis, it's more urgent than ever before that we find ways of engaging and interpreting the world in which we live, confident that the work of the eternal Logos is already going on around, among, and within us. Now, this is a project well beyond the confines of this lecture. But before we proceed, we need to note that how we talk about culture matters. Culture is ordinary. Culture is ordinary as the Welsh critic Raymond Williams famously noticed. So a contextual theology engages with what is simply there in the ordinary and unfinished circumstances of lived human lives. There is no scenario with which the church will not engage, offering the ministry of Christ. Diplomacy, and notably the expansive and distinguished work of the Holy See's diplomatic service, testifies to that engagement in a particularly strong and convincing way. When Christian churches consciously work together in areas which demonstrably share the ministry of Christ, they nourish ecclesiality. They reveal the gift of communion. The ministry of Christ is the ministry of koinonia, Joint witness in the realms of justice and peace is a form of sacramental witness which reveals the totus Christus, the whole Christ. Now, Anglicans and Catholics have worked together in situations of peace building for many years. I'm going to briefly discuss three which illustrate something of what I've been discussing. The first example is the Great Lakes Peace Initiative, which was launched in December 2013 in the DRC, Rwanda, and Burundi after more than two decades of extraordinary violence and bloodshed, which resulted in widespread humanitarian crises. Described as a silent emergency due to the world's lack of attention, it's estimated that the conflict claimed over six million lives through fighting disease and hunger between 1998 and 2009. The Catholic and Anglican churches of these three countries co-sponsored an enterprise seeking the wider participation of other churches, which was a joint commitment to laying the foundations for peace through engagement and the building of trust. Their focus was to shape grassroots support for an end to violence, to hold political leaders to account and to promote justice and reconciliation. When the initiative was first launched in Goma, the Catholic and Anglican bishops issued a statement indicating that their first intention, and I quote, 
was to witness to faith in Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. Not then just another movement promoting reconciliation, but a conscious act of joint mission, joint ministry. Now, although external regional pressures have now made this partnership more complex, this is a great example of how some of the poorest churches in both of our communions have worked together in this joint expression of Christ's ministry. Much better known, of course, is the attempted work of reconciliation in South Sudan, not least the recent initiatives of the Holy Father and the Archbishop of Canterbury alongside the moderator of the Church of Scotland, culminating in their pilgrimage for peace in February of this year. The language used at that time was very much the language of joint mission, and it was perhaps the image par excellence of walking together, the title of the very first agreed statement of this third round of Archic. But what is less frequently remembered is the very substantial collaboration between the Catholic and Anglican churches in South Sudan at the time of the independence referendum in 2009 through to independence itself in 2011. A joint pastoral letter from both Catholic and Anglican archbishops on the first anniversary of independence made an explicit reference to the ecumenical and ecclesiological ramifications of their joint witness. I quote them here. We, the Catholic and Anglican archbishops in South Sudan, stood and voted together in the democratic elections in 2010. Our two churches and their archbishops have stood together through many decades of war and peace. This solidarity was perhaps summed up at the Sudan Ecumenical Forum meeting in London in 2002. We rarely travel out of Juba at the same time, said the two archbishops. Juba needs an archbishop, and if only one of us is present, he is the archbishop for all the people of Juba. Here we see an example where our theological and canonical norms may be struggling to catch up with our practice. It's very easy to critique a situation like this as one of emergency, an exceptional context. But exceptions interrogate norms and sometimes help us move forward when our norms become stuck. My third example comes from Oceania, from Papua New Guinea and the Solomon Islands and the role played by the churches in tireless work for peace during the conflict between 98 and 2003. The violence, known as the tensions, was ethnic in character, largely between indigenous people of two of the major islands and perpetrated by militant groups, including some with governmental backing. Over 200 were killed and many hundreds wounded, tortured and raped. It was estimated that 92% of Solomon Islanders were Christian at that time. The Catholic and Anglican churches had begun negotiations for a covenant as early as 1995, but this was only signed at the end of the conflict in July 2003, only three months after seven Anglican religious had been martyred in the Solomon Islands whilst trying to bring peace to the warring factions. The Covenant committed Anglicans and Catholics to live, work and pray as one body in Christ, to do apart nothing which we can do together, and to do together what we cannot do apart." End quote. Furthermore, the two churches agreed to bring at least one representative of the Anglican Episcopate to Rome with the Catholic bishops on their ad limina visits. This, of course, was a practice first suggested in the Archic document of 1998, the gift of authority. But in 2003, the practice was still fairly novel. The extraordinary degree of unity and affection are joined by Anglicans and Catholics in PNG and the Solomon Islands emerged directly out of the experience of sharing together in Christ's ministry of reconciliation. The former Anglican Bishop of Malaita, Terry Brown, has written, I believe the voice of all the churches at all levels across the country, bishops, clergy, laity, religious communities, women's groups, 
ecumenical organizations prevented the conflict from becoming the genocidal situation it might have been. At an event hosted here in Rome by Sant'Egidio, the then British ambassador to the Holy See, Nigel Baker, reflected on the Melanesian Brotherhood, that Anglican religious community from which the seven martyrs had come in 2003. He said this, they are a simple community, rejecting worldly goods, concentrated on bringing together in unity and peace the fragmented and vociferous peoples of the 992 islands that make up the country. Diplomats argue a lot about peacemaking. I was pleased last week, the ambassador said, to be able to honor men who showed us how it should be done and who paid the ultimate sacrifice while doing so. End of quote. These seven martyrs are commemorated in the Basilica of San Bartolomeo al Tevere, along with many others who have given their lives from different Christian churches. Pope Francis, of course, has spoken so often of the ecumenism of blood. The world became particularly conscious of this with the persecution and mass killings of Christians of many denominations by ISIS, Daesh in the Middle East. Pope St. John Paul II's wonderful initiative to honor martyrs of different churches here in Rome in San Bartolomeo was further developed by Pope Francis's establishment of a commission for new martyrs just this last July. In the letter constituting that commission, the Pope refers to a vast panorama in which the single voice of the martyria of Christians resounds. In the Melanesian context, Christian unity was emerging in the practice of Christian ministry together. Diakonia in peace building and reconciliation alongside a strong sense of shared faith which culminated in martyria. That is the unity of the church. We need a better theological language with which to describe it and a mentality shift to integrate these practices more consciously within our sacramental accounts of one another. One of the richest ecumenical explorations of this theme is contained in the Anglican Lutheran Agreed Statement of 2011, which is entitled To Love and Serve the Lord, in a section entitled Diakonia as a Source of Unity. I quote, as they proclaim Christ in deeds of love and service, these churches find themselves in a deepening relationship. Even without official agreements, on the basis of their shared diaconia and martyria, they often find themselves moving towards a shared liturgia. The document continues to observe that sometimes, though not always, this is expressed in Eucharistic fellowship and in mutual sharing in Episcopal ordinations. A paragraph towards the end of this agreed document is worth quoting in full. These experiences, and indeed the history of the ecumenical movement, show that churches enter into relationships from different starting points. Shared projects of diaconal service or shared witness or agreements arising from formal dialogues between churches. The twin expressions, life and work and faith and order, always represent complementary ways in which the church's unity may be experienced and deepened. Our shared diaconia is an important place where these two strands of unity can be woven into one." End of quote. The Melanesian example of diaconia and martyria is also important for the internal life of the Anglican communion, reminding us that Christian unity, the life of koinonia, is a project of internal housekeeping for our churches too. At the 2008 Lambeth Conference of Bishops, beset by some of the internal and predictable Anglican conflicts we know so well, the Melanesian Brotherhood contributed substantially to the chaplaincy team. At the end of the conference, in the closing Eucharist, it was this Melanesian Brotherhood 
who led all the bishops present to the east end of Canterbury Cathedral, where the seven brothers were remembered and an icon blessed for the martyr's chapel. Again, a sign of Christian ministry through diaconia and martyria, which reached beyond the divisions within our own church, unveiling a reality, a reality of common life in Christ. So to conclude, Christ's ascension and his sending of the Holy Spirit upon the church have empowered his disciples to share his ministry. The New Testament is full of examples where faith and action belong together inextricably. These twin gifts characterize the life of the body of Christ. There is a danger that the otherwise very beautiful language of walking together, which characterizes so much of our ecumenical engagement, risks separating out those two substantive streams of faith and order on the one hand and life and work on the other. These streams belong together. They are in fact one movement. This must be the case because Christ's own ministry in which our churches share is one movement. The well-intentioned and positive encouragement we hear from so many Christian leaders, including the Pope and the Archbishop of Canterbury, of doing what we can together itself exposes the risk of failing to notice what is going on in such joint action. We behave so often as if there is always a further need for yet another injection of a faith and order agreement. I must stress that this is not to undervalue or to indeed understate the need for such agreements or to argue that there is not still further work to do. Of course there is. I'm delighted to work on some of it myself. But when Christian churches work consciously together in areas so clearly related to Christ's own proclamation of the kingdom of God, the Holy Spirit is at work binding us together because we share Christ's ministry. There are clearly all sorts of questions this raises, including how particular situations of partnership and intimate practical collaboration in local churches might shape the whole church. How is a local experience of life together for Anglicans and Catholics and for other Christians a shaper of the life of the whole church? Towards the beginning of this lecture, I quoted the final statement of those Iarchan bishops, which they made after their pilgrimage together from Canterbury to Rome in 2016. Here's a paragraph from the end of their reflections. Our pilgrimage made real the experience of the Paschal mystery. Just think about that for a second in terms of communion and ministry. We live under the shadow of the cross. We experience the silence of Holy Saturday and we celebrate the joy of the resurrection. As Anglicans and Catholics have done in their local context throughout the world, in our sharing with one another in conversation and prayer, we found ourselves living the real but incomplete communion that exists between our churches. The unity we seek is a unity which, to a significant degree, we were already experiencing." End quote. There are glimpses in this statement of a little bit of what I've been sketching. Might a greater consciousness of what is going on and a richer theological appreciation of such practical shared action move us closer to the Eucharistic sharing and the formal reconciliation of ministries and structures for which we long so very deeply. We are drawing together in this move a symphonic picture of the church's unity. This is ecumenism in doxological mode, a celebration of the Lord's ministry in the church for the life of the world, even, perhaps especially, at moments when the darkness of war, injustice, and poverty threaten to overwhelm us. This kind of joint witness needs to be taken into account as we reflect theologically, ecclesiologically, 
and using sacramental language. It needs to be received as an enrichment of the faith we profess together, which compels us to behave differently in our juridical and structural models. In fact, it necessarily interrogates those models and places them securely at the service of the church's ministerial and sacramental life. Our structures and our law should serve the gift of communion, which is enriched by the practice of a common faith and a fruitful sharing in Christ's ministry. One way of describing the integration, which I have suggested as essential in the next stage of our ecumenical journey, is to think of Christ himself, the totus Christus, the whole Christ, using the highly traditional image of the munus triplex. In his ministry, Christ is prophet, priest, and king. And it's this whole identity which he shares with his disciples. A saint much beloved and common to both our traditions, St. John Henry Newman, in his preface to the third edition of On the Prophetical Office of the Church, wrote this. When our Lord went up on high, he left his representative behind him. This was Holy Church, his mystical body and bride, a divine institution, and the shrine and organ of the Paracletos, who speaks through her till the end comes. She, to use an Anglican poet's words, is his very self below, as far as men on earth are equal to the discharge and fulfillment of high offices, which primarily and supremely are his. These offices, which specially belong to him as mediator, are commonly considered to be three. He is prophet, priest, and king. And after his pattern, and in human measure, Holy Church has a triple office too. Not the prophetical office alone and in isolation, but three offices which are indivisible, end of quote. Newman identifies these offices as teaching, rule, sacred ministry. But there's a very long tradition of reflection on the threefold office, which goes back at least as far as Eusebius of Caesarea in the fourth century. We might say that the threefold office of Christ helps us to integrate the church's action, her prophecy, with her faith and worship, her priesthood. As Newman teaches us, these categories cannot exist in isolation because they're characteristic of the whole Christ and his one ministry. When they're celebrated together in the symphonic communion of the church, the church herself becomes able to exercise that kingly munus. In that context, we might describe that gift as the gift of leading and shaping not only the body of Christ, but also the wider culture in which the church is embedded and for which Christ died and rose. This task of integrating our theology and our practice is an urgent one if we are to appreciate and celebrate the one ministry of the one Christ in which we share. How we account in theological terms for our actions together in areas such as peace building, reconciliation, and justice work, and name such actions as contributing directly towards the church's unity, may help us realize with greater intensity that the gift of communion we long for is already among us. Thank you very much indeed. I'm sure you'll agree with me that that was a moving uh, talk that embraced both the theoretical, theological, and the very practical and the concrete. The, um, at the theological level, we heard themes of sacramentality, of communion, ministry to culture, 
but always the ritornello, as they say in, in Italian, it's just integration, the holistic Christ, the integration of, of theory, practice, very beautiful. Uh, the, uh, talking about the practice, then the, the three examples of um, the Great Lakes region, Southern Sudan, and then the Pacific. The, the, uh, but there, the, the beautiful example of the Melanesian martyrs as catching both, really, the theory and the practice. That, that's very practical, very uh, engaged in social issues, but it is through their deaths that the moral influence of, of the real Christian message was, was being exercised. So thank you for a very moving talk, and we're delighted to have you with us in the Gregorian as much as possible, I think. So, well, the... Uh, excitement of the evening continues, I think. Uh, we have a great respondent uh, to this topic. Um, again, the theme of our speakers knowing whereof they speak. Um, the Archbishop Paul Gallagher is uh, born in Liverpool. Uh, just a word of um, friendship from a Dublin man here. There's been so much Irish emigration to Liverpool that we consider it the next parish after uh, uh, Dublin. The um, Ordained by a famous ecumenist uh, Archbishop Derek Warlock in 1977, um, had his feet on the ground in parish work. Um, I had never heard of uh, Fazekerli, if I pronounce it. Fazekerli. Fazekerli. Uh, the, so uh, the ordinary parish work, I, I, I understand. Uh, the, and then his life took off in a different direction. Uh, the, um, he did his doctorate in, the canon, in canon law here at the Gregorian, um, but uh, started in, as a diplomat uh, after training here in Rome uh, if, from May 1984 onwards. And listen to the countries that he, he's uh, been ministering in. Tanzania, Uruguay, Philippines, Burundi, in a very uh, conflicted situation, uh, the, and uh, Guatemala, Australia. So uh, what experience? The then 2014 nominated Secretary for Relations of St with States. Uh, from then on, um, in many ways, the voice of the Pope is articulated by Archbishop Gallagher in, in international affairs. Um, before talking about what were the conflicts it, it, to a limited degree, but uh, remembering the ordinary work, which is the bilateral relations uh, with, with states and then the multilateral relations. Um, Bishop, Bishop Gallagher is, is a committed supporter of the United Nations and a co consistent defender of, of, of its mission and very aware of its need for internal reform. Um, but then moving to, well, just what has been the history of the world since 2015. Um, uh, straight from the beginning, he was engaged with a serious um, uh, peace agreement uh, um, signed with the, between the Holy See and, the, and Palestine, with obvious resonances for today. The, um, then the, uh, the reality of the Syria-Iraq war always engaged, representing Pope Francis. Uh, and now there's the Ukraine uh, uh, war, where he's been outspoken, the, um, and then back to the Israel-Gaza. Um, perhaps a point to note is, if you're really peacemaking, you're not going to be popular with all sides. And perhaps we've been noticing this uh, in, in recent uh, year or so in the work of, of Archbishop Gallagher. But as we say, we have somebody who knows whereof he speaks as he responds now to this um, practical side, perhaps a little bit uh, more of, of the churches cooperating in international peace building. Thank you, Archbishop Gallagher. Father Rector, Dr. Hawkey, dear Jamie, Your Excellencies, Ambassadors here present, dear friends, allow me to begin by thanking the Rector, Father Mark Lewis, for inviting me to participate in this Lectio Magistralis, in which I think uh, the Rector's reservations about uh, Jamie's qualifications 
to conduct such an exercise, I think have been completely dissipated. And I'd like to thank Jamie too for his uh, insightful lecture. Dr. Hawkey begins his lecture by arguing about the important role of ecumenism. Indeed, the restoration of unity among all Christians is one of the principal concerns of the Second Vatican Council. There, the Catholic Church committed herself irrevocably to following the path of the ecumenical venture, thus heeding the spirit of the Lord who teaches people to interpret carefully the signs of the times. The ecumenical movement aims to rediscover the apostolic sense of the early church for unity in diversity and to confront the frustrations and difficulties of the modern pluralistic world, not to mention its ironies. This is achieved through mutual charity and committed efforts to promote greater unity among the diverse members of the body of Christ. One concrete expression of this is the October 2016 joint statement of the International Anglican Roman Catholic Commission for Unity and Mission, mentioned by Dr. Hawkey, in which the bishops said that the one way to communicate is led to the foot of the cross and thus discovers the communion of poverty, of persecution, even of blood. Indeed, as Pope Francis says, ecumenism is not an exercise of ecclesial diplomacy, but a journey of grace. It depends not on human negotiations and agreements, but on the grace of God, which purifies memories and hearts, overcomes attitudes of inflexibility, and directs towards renewed communion, not towards the reductive agreements or forms of ironic syncretism, but towards a reconciled unity amid differences. End of quotation. Ecumenism holds a significant place in the church's mission and pastoral practice, and is not a secondary matter or mere addendum. Pope Francis has declared ecumenism a priority during his pontificate, acknowledging that the Petrine ministry cannot be fully understood without this openness to dialogue with all believers in Christ. One of the foundations of ecumenism is recognizing that the separation of Christians is a significant hindrance to evangelism, a duty which we are called to undertake today. Moreover, the pursuit of peace in the world cannot be without the pursuit of peace among Christians, and therefore it cannot be without the pursuit of unity among Christians. In this context, Dr. Hawkey's example of Bishop Tutu highlights a clear fact. A fragmented church lacks the strength to confront injustices as evidenced by apartheid. Some may see the ecumenical movement and cooperation between churches as a reflection of international relations, since both aim to reduce tensions and promote cooperation. However, the approaches and methods employed are distinctly different. Dialogue is pivotal in both, but while international relations hinge on the principle of sovereign equality of states, ecumenism is underpinned by the shared baptismal bond and the desire for unity. The specific examples given by Dr. Hawkey of Anglo -Catholic, Anglican Catholic cooperation in the Democratic Republic of Congo, Burundi and Rwanda, in South Sudan and Oceania, show that together not only are our voices stronger, but our actions are more credible. Needless to say, our shared efforts are focused on ensuring the protection of human life, which is of utmost importance as stipulated in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Everyone has the right to life, liberty, and the security of person. However, if we examine the current state of the world, we cannot ignore the prevalence of warfare and devastation, where innocent lives are being lost due to the selfishness of those initiating and perpetuating conflicts, while the international community seems to be helpless and stagnant. 
Certain essential factors are indispensable for building a stable and renewed international order. As Christian communities, we must put into practice concrete actions that are born of a concrete will to pursue ecumenism in all its various manifestations, some of which Canon Hawkey mentioned, the ecumenism of the cross, the ecumenism of blood, the ecumenism of charity or diakonia. As Christian communities, we ought to take the first step towards peace, which in the biblical revelation is not solely the absence of war, but signifies the fullness of life. It is a divine gift bestowed upon all individuals which requires obedience to the divine plan rather than being a mere human effort. Peace is the consequence of the blessing that God bestows on his people. It was Jesus who in his farewell discourse on the eve of his death gave us the gift of peace as the seal of his spiritual testament. He stated, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Additionally, the words of the risen Lord will remain the same. Every time he meets his disciples, he greets and blesses them with the gift of peace. Peace be with you. As stated by Dr. Hawkey, Christ's ascension and his sending of the Holy Spirit upon the church enabled his disciples to become peace builders. In fact, working towards peace is always closely connected with proclaiming the gospel, which is essentially the good news of peace. It happens more and more often that the leaders of Christian communities join together in taking a stand in the name of Christ on important problems concerning man's calling and on freedom, justice, peace, and the future of the world. In this way, they communicate in one of the tasks which constitutes the mission of Christians, that of reminding society of God's will in a realistic manner, warning the authorities and their fellow citizens against taking steps which would lead to the trampling of human rights. It is clear, as experience shows, that in some circumstances, the united voice of Christians has more impact than any one isolated voice. The faith in Jesus Christ bears fruit in praise and thanksgiving for the blessings received from the hands of God, including the gift of peace, together with a strong sense of justice and true charity towards one's neighbor. This active faith has been responsible for many organizations for the relief of spiritual and material distress, the furtherance of the education of youth, the improvement of the social conditions of life, and the promotion of peace throughout the world. This is where we can focus on the ecumenical pursuit of peace, manifested through prayer and action by an increasing number of Christians with greater theological inspiration. And as Dr. Hawkey underlined, we must we must to walk together, doing what we can together. As believers in Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, we must seek greater unity in our opposition to all forms of violence, whether in the context of war or social injustice. On the other hand, we are called to make ever greater efforts so that it may be ever more apparent that religious considerations are not the real cause of current conflicts even though, unfortunately, there is still a risk of religion being exploited for political and polemical purposes. It is important to remember that the peace of Christ is first of all a reconciliation with the Father, and then a reconciliation with one's brothers and sisters. Through this dual process of reconciliation, Christians may become peacemakers and consequently partake in the kingdom of God as stated by Jesus himself in the Beatitudes, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Archbishop Gallagher.
the, uh, we say goodbye to some of our ambassador uh, friends who have explained that they uh, have other uh, appointments to go to and we're grateful for their presence with us. Uh, the, um, once again, we have the combination of the uh, theological and the practical from, um, a, or from Archbishop Gallagher, who is intimately involved in political dip diplomatic affairs. Um, Christ as peace giver is what we're convinced about that ecumenism is not the same as interreligious dialogue. We seek unity in, in ecumenism. Uh, the, uh, and then the, the very practical point that the united voice can have greater impact. Uh, indeed, we might add a disunited voice creates scandal. For your fortitude, we've kept going for quite a while. Um, I hand now over to uh, Father Renches. Just before I do, I'd like to say a, a special word of thanks to Father Keith Pecklers, who really organized so much of, of, of this evening, and in many ways it's his baby. Um, but just regarding Father um, uh, Renches, really this whole licentiate is his baby. Uh, the, uh, so the fact that he wasn't here is simply that as Dean of Theology, he had a, a major other uh, conflicting meeting. So, uh, but really he speaks with enthusiasm when he speaks now to uh, thank you all. Thank you, Jerry, for giving me the chance to greet you at least at the end of this important conference. As um, Father Whelan said, I don't know if you're aware, the Faculty of Theology is more than half of the University of the Gregorian. Uh, um, so it's, there's a lot going on. Hopefully, I, I, I would like to think of our faculty to be dynamic and certainly I would say the, the most important sign of this dynamicity is this new uh, specialization that we have, a, a two years license program in the study of comparative theology of the Christian the traditions and ecumenical studies. And uh, we started this, um, this is now, on, we go in our second year, and this is, in the frame of this license program, we launched our first Lectio Magistralis, and I would like to thank our speakers tonight, especially for, for being here, to giving us this very significant contribution. And I just was here for the questions. They, they were um, really fascinating to follow. And uh, I would especially like to thank you for the support we, because this is a new um, license, it's, and all the things in our century-long university, it takes time to kick in, to settle in, and uh, so we are really uh, looking for support for, for this license program. It is um, the first time that the Faculty of Theology addresses um, a program um, specifically also for non-Catholic students and we are really happy to have um, um, encouraged students from other denominations to register in this program. Of course the Gregorian has always had programs from other um, denominations, Christian denominations, also religions, but to really register for a theology, full theology program, a license, that is really something new. And it does so much of good, so much of benefit for, to our faculty. That's the way I can see this, how this develops. So thank you very much for your help, for your support, for your contribution. I um, thank you for being here, for showing the support to, to, to this initiative as well. I wish you all a very good evening, safe home, and I hope to see you soon here again. Thank you. <laughs>